about the middle of November. And he says, Tom, are you aware of what you're doing? And I said, yeah, I'm making a lot of money having a ball. <laughs> he says, no, but are you aware I did some figuring and you ha are averaging one home sale a day so far every day of the year. They will get hired and they will talk about the, the smartphone and you know how they can do this and how can they can do that. What three sales tips would you like to give to these kids? Because they are the future of this planet. That things that have not changed. Okay. Ten words you cannot say to a buyer. Now you quickly take out a card and I'm going to give you the ten words you should never say. Hi guys, wherever you are joining on my channel, Ashish Chanyani, it is a privilege to have you here today for what is about to unfold. I've been very fortunate, very, very fortunate to have a chance to interview some of the best people on this planet, but I have perhaps never been so excited and so privileged because the man that is about to join us today is honestly a dream come true. This man has been in sales for 40 years. In fact, let me say it this way. If you haven't heard about this man, if you haven't read his books or listened to his audio tapes, you are probably not in real sales. You cannot be in sales as a student without having come across this legend. I call him sir because this guy's written 17 books for million participants have joined his seminars in five continents live. That is besides the fact of 10,000 businesses multiply that by the number of employees that you want to have trusted him with this video and other online trainings. His first book, How to Master the Art of Selling has sold more than 1.6 million original official copies. It is, a big, it is my biggest privilege, I'm running out of words, to welcome on my show today, Sir Tom Hopkins. What a pleasure, Tom. What a pleasure to, to see you. My God, you're, you're like a dream come true. Well, that's super. Yeah, well, I'll tell you, this is thrilling for me too. You know, I... Your country is, you know, just exploding in so many ways. And, you know, it's always nice. I, I... Yeah. So, so, you know, Tom, uh, I want to I welcome you with this note uh, that you're a legend. Uh, and it's uh, every person who's been in sales has listened to you uh, at some point in time in their lives. And if they haven't, they've not yet studied sales. And that's just how it is. And I'm not saying because you're in front of me. I just know that is they, they find you and, and the amount of life effort that you've given back and the, the discoveries that people have made because of you, because people find their own meanings when, when they listen to, you know, your inspiration and others, uh, it's tremendous. So, so I want to welcome you with that note. At the same time, I want to start with this question, if you may allow me to, that, uh, People forget that you're a human. You know, when you become too big, people forget that you're a man, you're a human. And in that legacy, uh, they, I'm sure there are certain challenges that you faced when you were, in, you know, you were out there grinding it out there. Uh, what challenges a legend like you has faced that people should know about at the end of the day that Tom is also a human? Well, let me start off by saying I don't think there's anybody watching or listening to our message that hasn't been through a cycle that has been down or hurt not right for them because life is a, a matter of cycles. We have the up cycles and we have the down cycles. My challenge was, Ashish, that I didn't go to college and my mom and dad were the old school they sacrificed financially to get me to go to college and get a degree because my dad had a belief that without a college education, a degree, I probably could not become a success. And so I went to college, but I lasted for 90 days. I just, it wasn't for me. 
And I came home after three months of going to college and my dad came home and he says, so why aren't you in school? And I said, dad, I, I hate to tell you this, but I quit college. I don't want to go to college. <laughs> and Hashish, at that point, my dad was a strong man and I'd never seen him cry, but I'm not kidding. Tears filled his eyes. And he looked at me and he said, son, I'll always love you because you're my son, even though now based on your decision not to get an education, a degree in college, I know you'll probably never amount to anything. <laughs> now, that was my first <laughs> motivational talk. And I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure there's people joining us now that have had someone or something in their life where they had to prove that they could become successful. And I was, my dad, when he told me that, I went in my bedroom alone. I was depressed. I felt so bad. And my uncle came over for dinner that night, and he walked in my bedroom, and he says, Tom, is this true that you're not going to college? I says, Uncle Don, I don't want to go to college. It's not for me. The academic setting is not for me. And he said, well, what are you going to do with your life? I said, I have no idea. And he said, well, you know, we've just been given the job, and he was a general contractor for a steel company. We've just been given the job to build the uh, overpass highways from Los Angeles to San Francisco, and we are hiring, uh, and we need iron workers. Now, an iron worker, Ashish, is a man that carries the steel that goes in the cement structure. Now, most of our viewers have seen a swimming pool build, and they put a steel in it, and they put a bar about that big in, which is called a number four bar. And they put them every six inches because the concrete has no tensile strength without the steel. Well, on a bridge deck, the bar they usually use is a number 11 bar, which is inch and three eighths in diameter, about that round. They cut them in 60 foot lengths. They weigh over 200 pounds. And the only way they get them out to the deck is men like animals. <laughs> pick them out off the dirt, put them on their shoulder, and they carry them out to the deck. Now, I always at my seminars make a little joke about it. I go, yeah, I was six foot two when I started carrying steel, and now I'm only five foot seven. So, of course, I get a little <laughs> laugh. Out of I get a little laugh out of that. But I carried steel, hardest physical labor on the planet, for one year. And my dad heard from my uncle that I was a hard worker, that I outworked most of the older men. And keep in mind, I was just 18. And my dad came to me, he said, son, you know, you're 18 here in California now, and you can get a real estate license. You've got a nice way with people. Why don't you get a license? I said, oh, dad, I ha I, you have to pass an exam. And, you know, I'm not that smart. And my dad said, look, you can do it. And he chided me. And I finally said yes. And sure enough, Ashish, I failed the darn real estate exam three times. <laughs> and here I'm sitting there going, well, I'm a failure. I'll never be a success. And the fourth time, knock on wood, I passed and I got a real estate license. But here was the challenge. Now I'm just almost 19. I looked about 16. So I was young looking. I had no car. I had a motorcycle. So here I'm in real estate without an automobile to show homes. But I wanted to make it. And then the next challenge, I'm talking all the challenges. No broker would hire a young teenager like myself and so I keep going to real estate offices. Will you hire me? Give me a chance. And they'd all say, no, you're too young. And it was true. It was a middle-aged man's business in real estate back in the 60s. Hmm. And sure enough, <clears throat> one broker 
he he looked at me and said, I'm making a mistake to give you a chance, but if you'll show up, I'll give you a chance. And so I showed up mm-hmm. on my motorcycle. And of course, I walked in. I didn't have a suit of clothes because, you know, I was a teenager. So I had, you know, just a sports shirt and slacks on. And he looked up at me and he heard my motorcycle knowing I didn't have a car. And he stopped his meeting. He had about 15 salespeople sitting in front of him. And I snuck in the back. And he says, everybody listen up. I want to have you see and meet our new real estate agent. It's just Tom Hopkins. He's not quite 19, but he wants to be a success. He doesn't have a car. That was his motorcycle you heard drive up, but we're going to give him a chance. And that was really the beginning of me going into sales. And I did not do well in the beginning. See, a lot of people have this opinion that if you do have a reputation or a a success mode that you just started like that. And I didn't, Uh, I made one sale in the first six months and that was 40, $42 a month was my income in my first six months in real estate. And I'm broke. My savings from carrying steel as an iron worker was almost gone. I am so messed up and I I spent the last money I had to go to a seminar and the person doing the seminar, very talented man, he said, find the best person in your company, go to them and beg them to let you walk or, or ride, go along with them on appointments. And so I went to the company and I found out the highest income person in the company was a woman named Rose Lane. And I went to her, I said, Mrs. Lane, I'm 19, not just turning 19 now. And I I got my real estate license, but I'm not making any money. And at the seminar, the man said, find the top producer and ask, beg if you have to, if you can go along and listen to them. So I did. And so here I am, I'm asking if I can watch what you do. And she was so nice. She said, sure, when I show a home, you ride in the car with me. When I take a listing on a property, you come with me. Well, I was a sponge, as she said. I took notes, I listened to that woman. I wrote it, what she said, I rehearsed it. I was like an actor learning my lines, what to say. And all of a sudden I started getting a little confidence And sure enough, I I made a sale. He's saying some of the things she said. Then all of a sudden, I got a listing. And all of a sudden, I started getting a little confidence. And I then realized, and I know we have a lot of people involved in computers here, but I also realized a basic truth. Your activity, meaning talking and meeting people, will determine your long-term productivity. Mm. And so the income in the future is based on the quality activities of talking and contacting people, not just on a computer, but I think the computer has to be a device. And we're going to talk more about that, what we do to literally enhance our number of sales, thus our income, but not just by the computer, but how we move that to communicate with them the way they want to be communicated to. So, which we'll get into that as well. But all of a sudden I started making sales. I started making money and lo and behold, I won one month, the top income person and I won another month. And all of a sudden I realized I can do this. I can make sales. I'm gonna make some money. And sure enough, I spent eight glorious years, five actually doing nothing but knocking on doors and (laughs) selling properties, and three managing an office in the largest then company in the United States. And after three years of management, I said, I have to write a book, and then I want to teach others. And it's so funny how life works. I mean, I can't believe it, Ashish. I was 24 years of age. Now, this is my almost fifth year. 
and I was making so many sales. In fact, everything came together. Interest rates dropped. Uh, buyers who'd been not buying came out of the woodwork. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and my manager calls me in the office, and it's about the middle of November. And he says, Tom, are you aware of what you're doing? And I said, yeah, I'm making a lot of money having a ball. <laughs> he says, no, but are you aware? I did some figuring and you ha are averaging one home sale a day so far every day of the year. And that wouldn't be one every day, but I might have five home sales on the weekend. And because that was when most buyers would come in, of course. And he says, no one's ever done one sale a day for a whole year. And if you do it, people will beat a path to your door to have you teach them. Well, I figured, okay, why not? Sure enough, I, I worked my little tail off and I did it. Hmm. And it was amazing, Ashish. Everybody in real estate, the major companies, heard about this young kid, not even 25 yet, who sold 365 homes in a year, averaging one a day. And suddenly I get a call from the National Association of Realtors. This is the big national convention in Los Angeles. And the president calls me and says, uh, you know, Tom, we've heard what you did this last year, selling 365 homes. And would you speak at our convention? And, and this is how life is. Now, listen carefully, everyone, because when you're ready and have the right attitude, doors can open for you. Well, I went to the convention to speak. Now, keep in mind, young guy, first time, they were going to have me do what we call a breakout session, which means I'd probably speak to 150 people. And so there was 5,500 at the convention. And I'm going to speak at one in the afternoon to 150. Well, the convention started at eight in the morning. And so I put my suit and my tie on and my little speaker badge. And I went down to watch it kick off. And because I've got a speaker's badge, I'm standing in the back, the wings of the big convention uh, stage. And Suddenly, the president comes over to me. It's about now 10 minutes after 8 when it was supposed to start. And the featured speaker was a famous uh, author. And his book was a bestseller back then, uh, Thomas Peters. He wrote a book called The Peter Principle. And he was the featured speaker. Well, anyway, the president comes up to me and says, Tom, Peters is caught in L.A. traffic and he can't get here, we have to start. Can you go on? And so here, Ashish, instead of 150, I get to walk out in front of 5,500 people. And of course, here was the, the parameter. He, he said, you can only talk till he arrives. So I walked out on that <laughs> stage. And I looked out at that audience. I said, I don't have much time with you folks. Yes, I did do 365 real estate home sales in one year, and I learned a lot. I learned there's 10 words you cannot say to a buyer. Now, you quickly take out a card, and I'm going to give you the 10 words you should never say. Well, you heard 5,500 coats open and pins come out because they go, what's this kid going to teach us? And so there are what we call 10 rejection words. I said, don't ever say the word buy. Don't say when you want to buy a home. They don't want to buy. They want to look. So we always say the word own. When you own a beautiful property, not when you buy. And they're going, oh, I like that. No buy, own. I said, and don't tell them you, you've sold that home because they think you're going to try to sell them. You don't sell anybody. You get them happily involved in the opportunity of ownership. And they're going, ooh, I like that. Long <laughs> and short of it, I went through all 10 words. And I did it in 12 minutes. Wow. And as I finished the last of the 10, the president walked out and said, 
Ladies and gentlemen, our featured speaker, Thomas Peters, has arrived. What did you think of this young man? And I got a standing ovation, Ashish, like you would not believe. Wow. Because no one had ever taught that. And I went back to my real estate office and my phone started ringing off the hook. Mm -hmm. And I had people calling, please come and talk to me, teach my office, do the seminar for us. Blah, 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 blah. Well, I kept selling real estate because I said, you know what, I'm not ready yet. I'm, I'm too young to start a seminar business. And, you know, I had uh, built a pretty big overhead with my, now that I was making pretty good money, but I spent the next two to three years writing down everything I said to people. And that's one of the reasons I think people like my books and my training, because it's not just, and, and again, not saying this negatively, it's not just a motivational hype. It's here's what you say, here's how you handle people, here's how you communicate, here's how you handle objections, here's how you close a sale. And that's why I think not only have I spent 42 years living on an airplane every week, flying somewhere in the world teaching, but I've had gracious, wonderful people like yourself make the lovely comments as you did in the beginning and let's face it, if you have one life to live, what a wonderful thing to do, to live it, serving and helping others have a better life when you're doing better having that done. And of course, I have loved teaching people the field of sales and marketing because I, I think that regardless of what you do in life, you're either selling yourself or buying from others. You sell your kids to be good children. You sell your spouse to keep married to you. <laughs> so I think, <laughs> I think life is selling. And, and so that's really kind of my background. And uh, I overcame the challenges and, I, and it worked hard. And, and today, uh, my wife and I have a wonderful life and our children have knock on wood, but turned out to be great kids. No, we have no. great grandchildren. And so Hashis, it's been like a miracle, the life I've been blessed to live. And, you know, I mean, I, I want to continue. And of course, I, I was so thrilled that uh, Max Skill First uh, is the company that is marketing my training and programs in India. And so I, I so hope that folks, if they enjoy this 30 minutes you and I are sharing, that they look into our materials because uh, I really feel that people today need training more than ever. And people need to rely on eyeball to eyeball contacts with people. They have to learn how to turn a computer contact into an actual meeting. I think they need to learn how to take a telephone call and have that person desiring to have it become an in-person contact. And I think all the things that I taught those years and years ago, and of course, every two years, I rewrite uh, most of our books because life changes, cultures change. And one of the things I love doing is I'll go to a, a seminar to speak and I'll get the top five income earning salespeople in the room. You know, these are the people that are making the most money out of say 500 sitting there. Here's the five. And I get them alone, usually have dinner the night before and I pick their brains. What is happening today in sales? What are the skills that are most important? What changes have you seen? And I think I need to do that because I don't want to have a person come three years later and hear the same message. I think they have to hear the message that's current mm. to the population, to the entrepreneurs' lives at that point. And so that's that's kind of what I do. And it's just been, uh, it has been so fun to share things like we are right now and and, and having folks realize that most companies in not only the United States, but I think most major companies in the world prosper better if they have good people that go out and make good contacts and are willing to put their ego on the line 
handle the possibility of being told no. And I learned over the years that all the yeses you want in life are just hidden behind no's. Mm -hmm. And so if you can cope with all the no's, you'll get all the yeses. <laughs> and that's why, isn't that right? Yeah, yeah. So right. That's so deep. That's so right. Yeah. No, it's just so, the well, start of a yes. <laughs> yes. So, so what other questions do you have, my dear friend? Wow, I, I've got a couple more questions for you, but I, I want to tell you what a story. I, I just like, I was thinking I was with you while you were saying that story as of walking next to you. And I could feel the little Tom grow up, go through these things and maybe thinking, is this all happening to me? And your dad <laughs> must be so proud of you, right? He must be so proud of you. Wow. Oh my, wow. You know, it's funny. My dad, my dad, of course, has passed away, but, um, I'll tell you one quick story. Uh, I started setting my goals in writing, long-term, short-term. First goal, of course, was to buy a car because I had a motorcycle. So I got the car. Then I had another goal and another goal and another goal. And my uh, uh, fourth year or fifth year of doing uh, seminars, I had a goal to have my own airplane. And so I bought a Learjet. And, you know, it was kind of cool when you have your a jet, it's <laughs> neat. You know, this is a fun thing. And so I'll never forget, it had a phone in the plane. And I'm flying from some city to city in California. And sure enough, the plane phone rings. And I answered it. And lo and behold, it's my father. And I said, well, Dad, it's so nice of you to call. I'm up at 30,000 feet. I got my last big goal, the airplane. And my dad, and I think it might have been the first time, he said, Tom, I don't know if I've ever told you, but I am so proud of you and what you have accomplished <laughs> based on what I felt when you quit college. And so that was a highlight in my life. And we did become dear friends. Um, my, my dad was getting older. He loved golf and he had no money. So I went to flew, flew over to where he lived in California. I was now in Arizona at this point. And I flew to California and went to his home. And I said, dad, I, I have a little gift for you and mother. And he, of course, at that point was living in one of my properties as a rental because I gave it to him for nothing. I said, but I got a little gift for you. You love golf. So here are the keys to this beautiful little home. It's right on a golf course. I bought it for you and mother. And the only way you can keep it is if you play golf at least three days a week. And if I don't hear you're doing that, I'm going to evict you, <laughs> throw you out of the house. Well, it was a joke, but my mom and dad moved into that little home. And I'll never forget two Christmases later, my mom sneaks me off and she says to me, Tom, you have no idea. You changed your father's life. He is having such fun going out and playing golf. And he has his own little group and they meet and they go out. <laughs> He's a new, new person. And so those are the things you can do when you make money is, you know, there, there's yes. biblical truth and it's not so much what you get, but what you give. And the giving is the most wonderful part of life. When you're financially able to write a check to a brother or sister who's struggling, or if you can uh, give money or give a gift to your parents who might have not been blessed as you might be. And, and that is, I think, a, a highlight. Uh, that's why you got to make more so you can give more. And yes. if you start giving more, you'll start making more. And that's when you have a real ball in life. So yeah, far, and we're going to leave everything back, right? We're no, not taking anything, so why not make That's a right. lot so we can give a lot? <laughs> That's right, it isn't going with you. That's right. <laughs> so, there we go. Wow. So, Tom, I want, I want to ask you this question, right? Because, um, uh, there are kids out there who are 20 years old right now, they're born in 2001, 
and uh, they've not seen the world the way you've seen it and a part of it of how i've seen it right going out there uh, no phones writing letters or you know going to a phone booth making a call i mean this is like this is not the planet right <laughs> they were born on and and they're going to figure out sales now so they will get hired and they will talk about the the smartphone and you know how they can do this and how can they can do that what three sales tips would you like to give to these kids because they are the future of this planet that things that have not changed okay the first tip i would give them is pay fast attention to details meaning take care of all the little things in your life and there won't be big challenges and and by that i mean you, you many people put off little things and just keep saying i'll do it tomorrow do it tomorrow become a do it now person to where things that should be taken care of you do now and so uh, that would be the first thing i would say i also would say that you must keep closer in touch with clients become what i call a keep in touch follow up specialist Mm. to where you keep in touch and I'll give you one idea that I did when I got so darn busy and had so many clients and I became friends with my clients well you know you get so darn busy you can't do much to keep in touch with them all so what I used to do is I would wait till 9 or 10 o'clock at night especially cuz I'd know they wouldn't be where they worked and I had all my clients filed by everything. I knew that uh, Jim worked at such and such and he worked there 9 to 5 5 days a week. But I knew he wasn't there at 9 o'clock at night. So at 9 o'clock at night I would call and I would call with a quick message. Jim it's Tom Hopkins. Hi, listen, it's 9 at night. I know you're at home with your family. I just wanted to tell you I am so proud to have you as one of my clients and hey we we'll have a wonderful day today and a better week all the best now the reason I do it at night is I don't have to get into all this conversation but he gets there in the morning and I think you you know, on a computer situation this could certainly be done where the message would be t- mm. put in when the, you're sure they're in bed then the next morning they wake up turn on their computer and there's your message just w- welcoming them to a beautiful new day always say things like enjoy the day and and make it a better tomorrow and i look so forward to working with you for many years in the future and and, and these type of things are what endear you to people and I, and then, of course, I used to have a, a party every year for every one of my clients. And I'd rent this big hall. The last client uh, party, I had 600 folks show up and had a chance to invest that whole evening with these people. So you may want to look at an annual type of dinner or something with your best clients. Be a follow-up specialist. Pay fast attention to details. And... Work harder on yourself than you do on your job to be a person that people like, trust, and want to listen to. Hmm. Become a better you, and you'll attract and gravitate more people to you. And in doing so, you'll fulfill your dreams, your goals. You'll become the person that you have always dreamed of, which... I so hope happens to all of you that have been gracious enough to watch Ashish and I in our few minutes together. And uh, if anything we say and do can have you have a better life, then what we're doing is the right thing. And I thank God every day that we have the ability to do that. Wow. Wow, Tom. So I want you to know this and I'll ask the final question. People know you in India. They admire you. Just before our interview, I was speaking to a Fortune 500 client in India. We just finished the book on HR, oil and gas company. And I said, you know, I'm interviewing Tom Hopkins. And they were like, oh, wow. Um, I think the programs that you have that you were speaking about 
if you can highlight that a little bit uh because this interview is going to reach out to a lot of people in the next four weeks so you know i mean whenever sure. people see it we recorded this in Jan in february of 2021 uh you 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 know tom hopkins was live with us and uh you know he's got things in india and people know you so if you can talk about that and how do you see the future of sales changing is my final question okay. to you i'm going to summarize okay. with that sure well i'm also honored and flattered that uh our firm, Max Skill First, and that's who you would go to on, on uh, maxskillfirst.com, and they have all of my products, uh, books, CDs, DVDs, and they can make sure they show you how to get them. And so that would be what I would suggest. Uh, I, I really think my first book, How to Master the Art of Selling, is one that I think anyone who sells in India could take and just lift it, all the phraseology, all of it out. And I, of course, have a nut on taking your car and making it a classroom. So I think a CD today where you hit, you're not only as you are the motivational, and I love Motivational Diaries, what a great name. <laughs> and I think, I think that, you know, taking your car and every driving mile can be a learning mile. They, they've guesstimated that you'll spend 5,000 hours in business driving. And rather than have that be the negativity of news or just music, which I love music, don't get me wrong, but if you can make every driving mile a learning mile and, and again, listen to me or, or Hashish or anyone who you can put in there and, and I really feel that's one of the keys. And the future, I really believe in sales, is always going to be critical. Because like in the United States, a, com a country of free enterprise and capitalism, most companies would not be profitable without someone getting out and talking about what they do. And, and if you analyze television advertising, I mean, there's, today everybody is really selling. And of course, it's a way of life. But I think, you know, I, I am so prejudiced about the field of sales. Many people are <laughs> afraid of it. Many people hear the term selling and think they've got to be high pressure and pushy, and they don't. They be if they become master listeners, master questioners, they focus on their goals. They help people to have a better life with the benefits and don't forget this now, people don't buy your product or service. They buy what it'll do for them after they own it. In fact, I never really sold a home. I sold 365 plus properties that gave them a beautiful fireplace, gave them a wonderful backyard for the children. They don't buy what it is, they buy what it does. And so you must master and present properly what the benefits they'll re retain by saying yes to investing in what you do. And then you got a win-win life. Wow. What a note. What a note to leave these guys with, Tom. That's, that's beautiful. Uh, I just want to say a big heartful thanks for the conversation. You pouring your heart out. It was just as if I was listening to you live, you know, out there in the audience in the seminar. And, um, you know, a stat is that now people spend five hours on the phone or on the computer. So they've got more time, you know, listening to the <laughs> audios, right? So they don't even have to drive. They've got more time and they've got more energy because now they don't have to focus on the driving part of it. That's so true, Ashish. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Ashish, do keep in touch and bless you and your company for helping other folks and uh, look forward to the future we'll share together. All the best, my man. Yes, you too. You too. Thank you. And I'll stay in touch. I'll speak to you. Please do. You have bye a bye great now. day, Tom. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.